Excuse me? Well, um, I've been doing this for most of my lectures uh, for both for me, four courses that I have prepared for this uh, uh, university. So if you take one of the other courses, you will find the videos as well. So you can always refer back to those videos if you want to. Um, yes, uh, I don't know. I mean, MIT, for instance, they all the professors post their, their videos. Those are available. If you want to look at those uh, lectures, you can do that. And there's a lot of univers universities that currently post their lectures. It's not like you're going to be an engineer if you look at the videos. You actually have to go through the process of come to the university, do the homework, do the exams, and get to, to the process of graduation. But those videos are actually um, a good source of information for the future after you graduate. Um, so going back to the lecture, um, talking about meetings, how to report uh, your your findings and also the uh, the reports that you prepare for your project in terms of uh, monitoring your project. And there's also some steps that I want to discuss in terms of maximize the effectiveness of your meetings. So home meetings to take advantage of the face-to-face -face interaction. So sometimes that's the only time that you're going to have to talk to uh, senior management. So you have to be able to maximize that time that you're going to have with people that are very busy at the company. Um, and there's also opportunities of doing some uh, technology, use, take advantage of technology such as using Skype on, on or the, any other video chat um, tool that can also help for holding your meetings. Uh, distribute a written agenda in advance uh, of the meeting. So the time for distributing the, the agenda should be sufficient for the attendees to prepare for the meeting. So you don't want to send the agenda uh, an hour before the meeting. You want to give them some time to prepare. In Actually, if they have to complete something for the meeting, you want to give them at least a day for reading the agenda. Um, if a crisis arises, a meeting is deemed necessary to deal with it. Make sure the meeting is um, restricted to that issue or subject. So you don't want to, if there's a crisis or something important that needs to be fixed for your project, you want to hold a meeting just to take uh, care of that uh, issue. You don't want to bring anything else because sometimes you're going to end up doing everything but what you plan. So that's in terms of the meetings. Um, steps can be taken to maximize the, the effectiveness. So if homework needs to be done before the meeting, check to be sure that they will be prepared. So if you're expecting that a subordinate or an employee take care of part of the meeting, you need to check with that employee to make sure that the, he is prepared or she is prepared to take care of that uh, portion of the meeting. And also make sure that you are prepared. If you're the chair of the meeting, meaning that you are supervising and controlling the meeting, you should take care of your own minutes. And we talked about this before. We talked about the importance of the minutes. You want to record everything that is discussed in the meeting for future reference, especially if you are uh, assigning tasks. You want to be able, able to refer back to those documents in case that there's some misunderstanding between the members of the meeting and on the members of the team. So, uh, the minutes should contain a final set of actions, including what is to be done, by whom, and when. These are very important. One more, more time. It's a very important piece of documentation. For a project, and you should not delegate this responsibility especially if you are the chair of the project, the project manager, and, and so on. should be able to take care of those um, minutes 
and I gave you a template in case you are familiar with how to take those minutes. So this is a template that I use frequently. So the idea is to have as much information as possible about the meeting so you can record um, details such as the attendees, who is the timekeeper, note taker, the facilitator, and so on. And then you're going to have some time allowed to each topic. So if you're going to discuss only one topic, you want to um, provide a title for that and then provide the conclusions after the discussion and the next items that are going to be taking on uh, to fix the problem or to continue with the project. So you're going to have those action items and also the person responsible and the deadline for such items. Any, any questions? Okay, so this is about it in terms of the meanings. Again, this kind of look obvious, but it's very important that you remember those details, especially when you're studying on a new job. You want to look professional and you want to uh, be able to perform at certain level. So if you are taking care of these details uh, early on, you will basically uh, do very well. So now let's talk about a uh, different way to monitor your project, and this is called the earned value. And this is basically a performance measure that you can use to check on the status of your project and to see if you are doing as you were expecting at certain point, let's say at certain milestones. You want to check if you're performing as you were planning. So this is a very nice measure to have. Uh, so far we have discussed monitoring segments of project stats, of tax and such. Uh, of primary importance, however, is to deriving some measure of the overall of the progress of the project in terms of these three items, performance, budget, and scope, or schedule. Um, such a measure is the what we call the earned value. And the performance of a task or project cannot be evaluated by considering only the cost. And the earned value of a task or a project is the budgeted cost of the work actually performed. So we're going to look at the performance of a certain point of your project and we're going to look at how much money should be uh, allocated to the project at, up to that point. And if we are going above the budget projected, then we know that we are doing something wrong. And we need to find ways to bring the project back to uh, as was scheduled. So it is calculated by multiplying the bu budgeted cost of a task by the percentage of completion of the task and summing overall the task of the project. But the issue is that uh, the budget because of tasks is clear. You know how much money you can allocate to each one of the tasks. But when you go to estimate the percentage of completion, that's very subjective. So for some people, you might be 50% uh, close to completion. But from another perspective, that would be 35% and so on. So that's very difficult to estimate. So, for example, the major cost of a task might be obtaining uh, the machinery to do the task, a cost that will be incurred before any progress is made on a task. So, let's say you're trying to uh, de uh, develop a new production uh, line. 
and you know that you have a budget that's scheduled for setting up that production line, and you need to buy some equipment. But in order to fit, to put that uh, production line into production, you need to buy that equipment before you actually set up the production line. So you're going to incur these costs very early, and that can affect the percentage of budget completion at the at that point because you're going to incur that large cost early on. So there is no satisfactory way to measure um, the percentage of completion of most tasks. So that's why there are three conventions that have been adopted in industry for doing such estimations. Uh, but they might not be confused with the reality. So this is not necessarily representing the reality of the progress of the project. So the first of them is called the 50-50. So the task is listed at 50% complete when work is initiated and then the other half is going to be completed uh, by the end of the task. So if you start the task, then you're saying that you are 50% completion, and then when you complete the task, then you are 100% completion. Uh, this approach avoids the difficult problem of trying to estimate the progress while the task is being executed. And problem is our states the earned value of tasks that have been recently begun, but understates the earned value of the task nearing to completion. So you see, you're only taking these two. If it is started, 50%. If it is completed, it's 100%. And that might create some um, difficulties in terms of the earned value. The second is the 100% when the task is completed and 0% before that. So if you don't complete the task, then you are not, um, you are not gonna have any percentage of completion. Uh, this is a very con conservative approach that will only show project progress that is um, achieved. Projects, however, will always appear to be behind schedule. And that's very obvious, right? You're only putting some percentage of completion when you are done with the project or the task. And upper management will be in a constant state of worry about the project progress. The third way to, or convention to uh, estimate the progress is called the estimate percentage completion by using the ratio of cost expended to the total cost budget uh, for a task. And this ratio of the time, actual time is elapsed relative to the total schedule, past time, or a combination of that. So basically, this one is the hardest one, so we are going to try to say, okay, we are this uh, much completed at this point of the project. And that's what, um, what the last one is doing. So the third is, again, the estimate uh, percentage completion by using the ratio of cost expended to the total cost budget for a task. And we're going to look, uh, look at that ratio in a second. So in terms of uh, showing you a representation of what we are trying to do, um, so we, when you start planning for your project, you're going to have a budget. You're going to know how much are you going to spend uh, per time period. So we can represent that cost schedule plan with that curve that is plotted here in the middle. So as time progresses, you know that the amount of money that you're going to be spending will be, when you look at the aggregated total, will be increasing. Now, we're going to have also, so that's the plan. This is the line that represents the plan.
but we also gonna have some actual costs which is basically telling you this is how much you are spending this is the plan the red one is a plan the actual cost is the one that represents your progress so right now you can look at by looking at that example you are uh, spending more money than what you budgeted for the for the project and then we're gonna have the the curve that represents the earned value and that's based on the ratio that we're gonna discuss so using these three lines we can also estimate other performance in terms of the variance so we can look at the schedule variance and also the spending variance for the project so spending variance and schedule variance So, the earned value completed today tells the manager whether progress is up to expectation. It is the baseline plan for this point in time. So, we're going to use this ratio one more time to look at the progress of the project or the task. Any difference is called the schedule variance. Which shows how much the project is ahead or behind schedule. And again, what we are trying to do or to explain in this lecture is we want to be able to monitor our project to check if we are um, going according to the plan. If not, then we're going to have to do some things to control our project and to bring them back, bring the project back to uh, what was scheduled. So, uh, the figure this figure shows the value completed to date, to date is less than the baseline estimate for this point in the project life and represents about a 10 day delay which results in a negative schedule variance the delay is negative then the actual cost And that's what's represented by AB. I'm sorry, AC here. It is about uh, the value completed, so resulting in negative or bad spending variance. So again, you are spending more money than what you were scheduled or budgeted for the project. So the figure represents a difficult situation, a project significantly behind schedule. And over budget by the time we were looking at so that would be after the first month so going back to the variances of the earned value are calculated based on two simple rules. Um, negative variance is bad and a positive variance is good. Second one, the expending 
and schedule. Values are calculated as the earned value. minus some other measure. So we have all, uh, these two balances right here and providing you with the uh, formulas for both of them. So the cost or spending variance equals the earned value minus the actual cost of the work performed. And the schedule variance equals the earned value minus the planned cost of the work budgeted and scheduled to have been performed to date as determined by the baseline plan. Another way to, or handling the data that is more useful for making comparison at different points in time or uh, across projects is to take ratios of the measures rather than their differences. And we're going to look at those ratios in a second. So we're going to have two different ratios, the cost performance index and the scheduled performance index. So the cost performance index equals the earned value divided by the actual cost. And the scheduled performance index equals the earned value divided by PV. And something that you need to uh, always remember is that values that are less than 1.0 are undesirable. So you want to have a ratio that is greater than 1, greater or equal to 1. That will uh, mean that your project is uh, on schedule in following the budgeted plan. So here I have an example. Suppose that a work on a project task was expected to cost 1500 to complete the task and the workers were originally scheduled to have finished today. As today, however, the workers have actually spent uh, $1,350 and our best estimate is that they are about two over three finished or uh, 66 percent of completion for the project. So we want to calculate these two ratios. So the first thing we have to do is to find first the cost spending variance And as we mentioned, that's equal to the earned value minus the actual cost. So the earned value is going to be the budgeted plan for the, for the project times the percentage that is completed. So that will be 1,500 times 2 over 3 minus the actual cost that's 1350 and that is equal to minus 350 so as you can see our variance is negative and we stated here that a negative variance is bad so that project is having some difficulties. And as we observe here, we know from the statement of the problem that the project is behind schedule. Then we have the schedule variance. This is equal to the earned value 
minus the planet cost. So this is equal to same here times two thirds minus this and again negative so that's bad then finally we want to compute the cost performance index so CPI equals the earned value divided by the actual cost so this is 1500 times two-thirds divided by 1,350, so 0.74. Now we're, instead of looking at the balances, we're looking at those ratios. And again, one more time, that ratio is less than one. So that's also telling you that the project is not performing as expected. And finally, we have the schedule performance index which is equal to the earned value time divided by the present cost. Two-third and that's 0 0.67. So all of those measurements are telling you that there's something wrong with the project or project is having some difficulties, so there's something that needs to be done uh, to control the project and to bring the project back to schedule. Thus, we are spending more than the baseline plan in the case, and given that we have spent, we have not made as much progress as we should have. So that's the problem with this particular case. Okay, so again, these are good ratios and measurements that you can use to track the performance of your project um, and to know how bad or how good you are doing with the progress of your project. Um, additional items of interest, the estimated or remaining cost to completion, that's ETC and the projected total cost estimated at completion EAC so these are two other measurements that we can use and for example given that the budget at completion is 1500 and the earned value is a thousand we can estimate the estimated cost to completion and that will be equal to this budget at completion minus the earned value divided by the CPI. So that would be equal to 1500 minus 1000 divided by 0.74. And that's 676. So the estimated remaining cost to completion will be that $676. Uh, note that this assumes that the work will be completed at the same level of efficiency or inefficiency as conducted so far. So we are assuming that the rest of the project will be completed at the same pace as uh, the progress so far. Now we, we can also estimate the total cost to complete the task. And that is uh, a e a c, which is going to be equal to this. So this hundred seventy six plus so your estimated or projected total cost estimated at completion will be. 2,000 to uh, 200, 2,026. Any questions? Okay. 
So it's good to see some math after we have uh, going through most of the details. So again, these are good ratios, good uh, measurements that you can use to estimate the progress of your project. Finally, in terms of uh, the earned value, if the earned value calculations indicate a cost or scheduled deficiency, the project manager must figure out what to do to get the project back on budget or schedule. Some of the options include, and we have discussed some of these options before, so borrowing resources from other tasks. Holding a brainstorming meeting with the project team uh, requesting extra resources from senior management and informing the client of the project efficiency. And for that last one, you better have a better, uh, a good explanation or reason for uh, informing the client of a deficiency on your project. So that's um, that's the end of the first part of this lecture, which is monitoring the project. And these are the topics that we cover in this part. So we went through the monitoring. Uh, we actually went through the monitoring part. Um, we talked about reports, meetings, and the data collection. And we also discussed the earned value analysis. Now, I want to transition to the second portion of this uh, lecture, which is controlling the project. Okay, so we talk about monitoring the project. Now, we're going to talk about how to control the project. And these are the objectives that are related to this topic, that we, they are basically the same that we uh, discussed for the monitoring. And these are the, uh, the agenda. So we can talk about the project control in terms of the purpose of control, and then how to design a control system for your project. Um, the objectives are the same as the previous lecture. So understand the issues related to monitoring and controlling the project, describe and plan, monitor and control cycle, and describe the strategies for uh, data collection and reporting. So what is project control? What are we trying to do with this? So we talked briefly about control in our previous lecture. This is the act of reducing differences between the plan and actuality. Or the current status of the project. So the final element in the planning 
monitoring and controlling cycle. So this uh, figure here illustrates the process. So we, we're going to look at where we are at this point in time. Then we're going to check on where we're supposed to be. We're going to use some uh, evaluation method. And then we're going to bring back the project to uh, schedule or to track if, if we need to by using some uh, controlling measures. So the control has the primary purpose of ensuring that the project is in compliance with its objectives. And it's one of the most difficult tasks for the project managers because it, it involves both um, mechanistic and human elements. And that's what makes it difficult, especially because it involves human behavior. So you can plan on having a group of people working on that task, and you're expecting them to complete the task in, in two weeks, but a lot of things can happen. Um, people can get sick, or they might not have a, bed, a good day. They're, there are going to be always things that can delay um, that are related to human behavior. Um, so controls means interceding in an activity that someone has been doing and correcting it. So that's what makes it difficult, especially when you're dealing with people, because that's basically recognizing that that person is doing something wrong and you want to fix uh, what he's doing or she's doing incorrectly. So it implies that someone was at fault and doing something wrong. Another reason that makes control difficult is that problems are rarely clear-cut. It's always a combination of things, and that makes it difficult. Uh, determining what to control raises further difficulties. So what are the purposes of control? There are two primary card purposes. The first one is dealing with the organizational assets and the regulation of results through the alteration of activities. So asset will include human resources, will include the um, machines, <coughs> any other thing that is part of the organization. Um, physical asset uh, control is concerned with the maintenance and use of the project physical assets, and this includes the timing as well as quality of the conducted conducted on the asset. Quality. Right. And I'm showing this picture here. Um, now, if you guys have the opportunity to visit a company such as uh, Samsung or Intel, if you, if you haven't visited one of those companies, I really recommend you, if you have the opportunity to go uh, to do that. Um, there's a lot of uh, very interesting processes that are happening in, in such type of industry. And I'm showing one of the machines that are uh, used to, to assemble some of the computer boards. And those machines usually can... Uh, assemble a bore in less than a minute. They will put like a thousand parts in that bore really quick and 
The other thing about those machines is that they need to be um, maintenance perform of those machines uh, very often because you're going to have those rolls that are going to contain a lot of components. So when the components are running low, you're going to have to stop the machine production and go and refill. So that actually relates to the timing and the quality of maintenance conducted on, on such assets. <coughs> now, in terms of the human resources, the stewardship of human resources primarily involves controlling and maintaining the growth and development of the project team. And last, financial control involves stewardship of the organization expenditures on the project, including the conservation of financial resources and the regulation of resource use. And here we have another good example of the use of extensive control to help it produce a successful project. So this is a project that was um, performed in San Francisco. It's called the Metro Turnback Project. And basically what they did was to build this underground train under the city of San Francisco. So this city usually is very busy during the day. So uh, planning such type of project and performing such type of project uh, requires a lot of planning. So this is an 11 year underground construction project that was conducted in the high traffic downtown region of the city. And to keep the project on schedule within the, and within the budget, an extensive complex management plan and control system was used. So how to design a control system? There are three primary mechanisms by which the project manager exerts uh, control. The first one is process reviews. The second one is personal assignment. And finally, resource allocation. So the process review is directed to an analysis of the process of reaching the project objectives, rather than on the results. OK, so our focus is going to be how well are we doing in satisfying or completing the objectives of the project. Um, Control can also be exerted through the use of personal assignments based on past project productivity. So you're going to go and check how well these uh, resources that you have available for your project perform on past projects. And using that information, then you can have a better idea of how long it's going to take you if you assign a person to a specific task. Now, controlling the resource allocation can be a powerful motivator or the motivator.
So resources are usually allocated to the more productive <laughs> task. And result this result in significantly influence the attainment of project results. So what we're trying to say here is that if you have some resources that are uh, good, they're usually are going to be assigned to those more productive tasks that are going to provide the most benefit to your company. So that can also uh, influence the completion of your projects and your tasks. So if your project is not considered one of those productive tasks or productive projects, then you might have to figure out a way to uh, show up that your project is important. Um, so you can get access to those resources. Um, we have two primary access or two primary types of control system used by project managers. The first one is called go or no go controls. And the second one is called post control. So the go, no go control takes the form of tasks. It's like having some sensors to determine if some specific precondition, standard and competitor, has been met before permission is granted. To continue, this is the decision, and effective. So basically what you're doing is if you complete these requirements, then which are based on previous uh, experience or, or the standards by the product manager, then you're going to be granted a, yes, go ahead. Decision, I'm sorry. So if you satisfy those requirements, then you're going to be granted permission to continue with the next task or project, um, next task of the project. And next we have an example. So here's a standard report using the agricultural product divisions of a large chemical company. So basically you see uh, Z's are completed tasks. W is work in progress. <coughs> so for those W's that you observe a number next to them, that means the number of weeks or days that are left for completion. Um, then we have not started, uh, needed resources, and have resources. So, do this, as you see, a list of C is meaning that you have completed all these tasks, and then you can start the next two tasks. Once you complete those, then uh, permission is going to be granted to continue with the next uh, couple of tasks. Uh, so, this is an example of a go, no go control. Um, we also have the post control, and it is also known as post performance reviews, and this is applied after the project has been completed. And the purpose here is not to control the already completed project, but to allow future projects <coughs> to 
to learn and profit from the past project experience. Okay, so this is not going to help you a lot in terms of the current project, but it's going to give you some history about the performance of those projects and in the future you might be able to use that information for planning for next projects. Okay, so at this point I need to stop and give you some time to uh, complete the students' evaluations for the class.